There's been a lot of commentary in just these last 24 hours about just how unprecedented these events are, that America is taking a step into the unknown, the abyss, by prosecuting an ex-president. Peter Baker, the chief White House correspondent for The New York Times, wrote, for more than two centuries, presidents have been held on a pedestal, even the ones swathed in scandal, declared immune from prosecution while in office, and effectively even afterward. No longer. That taboo has been broken. And it is true. These events have no precedent in the history of our country. It's an enormous, enormous deal that's happening now. I don't want to undersell this. But there's something about that framing, which is not just Peter Baker's, it's widely shared, that I find a little alarming and, and misleading. This idea that this is the moment that we jumped off the map into the abyss. That moment actually happened when that guy, Donald Trump, was elected president of the United States. That guy, Donald Trump, a president, a, a man who clearly had a history of lawlessness and demagoguery, a guy who just, to pick one thing at random in his campaign, issued a call to ban more than a billion people from entering this country purely based on their faith alone. One of the most flatly offensive assaults on American values I've ever seen. When that guy won... That is when we jumped off the cliff. That is when we left the map and went into the darkness, the uncharted territory. And remember, that win was an incredibly narrow, fluky victory. 78,000 votes out of over 100 million across three states go the other way, and there would have been no Trump presidency. He lost the national popular vote by nearly more than a million votes. And not only that, that narrow, fluky victory was helped along, but not one, but two different criminal conspiracies. One, quite famously, involved a hostile foreign government, Russia, which stole a trove of emails from the Hillary Clinton campaign and then leaked them to benefit Trump. Did some other stuff as well, but that was really, really the big main event. That was one of the criminal conspiracies that helped elect Donald Trump. The other criminal conspiracy to help elect Donald Trump was to make hush money payments to women Trump had affairs with, an adult film actress and a Playboy model, in violation of campaign finance law. Michael Cohen, then a loyal attorney and fixer for Trump, ended up pleading guilty in that criminal conspiracy and served prison time for it. In his plea, in court, Cohen confirmed he performed these illegal acts at the direction and for the benefit of a person referred to in the documents as Individual One. He later identified that person as Donald Trump in open court and before Congress. So that was part of what helped Donald Trump win his fluky victory in 2016, get in the White House to begin with. Now he actually faces criminal charges in that very same case, though they're local charges, not federal ones. Just so the notion we are making some crazy departure from reality or from the past, or at least from like, what is acceptable, what is taboo, it, it doesn't fair square with the fact that accountability for public figures and public officials is routine in just about every other public office. Probably not as routine as it should be. Let me just take one an example. It's a state near and dear to my heart. The great state of Illinois. I lived and was a reporter in Chicago for years. A decade ago, you might remember this, Democratic Governor Rob Bogoyevich was convicted in Illinois on corruption charges, and he was incarcerated. And get this, at the time of his conviction, Blagojevich was the fourth of the state's previous seven governors to be sent to prison. Like, if you were governor of Illinois, it was more likely than not you would go to prison. Those were the odds. So that shows legal accountability for chief executives in government can happen. It could span decades, and it can happen again and again and again. And heads of state around the world have been tried and convicted according to commonly held laws. The former president of South Korea, an advanced, developed democracy, imprisoned after being convicted of bribery, other charges, just a few years ago. In 2021, former French president Nicolas Sarkozy was convicted in one trial of trying to bribe a judge, and in a second trial for, wait for it, violating campaign finance laws. Not to mention, as we watch all this, oh my gosh, what will happen, hand-wringing, it's not like America has a problem putting people in prison or charging people for crimes. For years, we've had the highest 
incarceration rate in the world. It's gone down a little bit. Even now, we're still up there, incarcerating a higher percentage of our population than places like China or Russia. The vast, vast majority of those people, our fellow Americans that we put in prison, do not have the resources or the status or the fame or the platform or the power that one Donald Trump has. No, what happens to them is they get led into central booking and they get arraigned and maybe they go to Rikers or their local jail and God knows what happens to them there. And then most of them end up pleading out. And many times, let me tell you something, if you've worked around the courts, they plead out even if they're kind of flimsy cases. Happens every day in this country. Get this, in all of 2021, the last full year we have data for, just 1% of felonies in New York City went to trial. And guess what? I'm going to rock your mind again here. Sometimes in this country of ours, people end up going to jail for things under questionable legal theories or circumstances. But here's the thing. The one thing we can be sure of here is that Donald Trump is not going to be in that situation. Donald Trump is not going to be railroaded. He's not going to have some lawyer cajole him into a plea while they've got 90 other cases. <laughs> He will have the best lawyers he can find and pay for, along with the resources and the weight of all his accrued status and power. This whole thing of, if they could do it to Donald Trump, they could do it to you, is exactly inverted. No, the nation already does it to you. It already does it to everyday citizens. Can the nation actually hold to account in a fair and reasonable manner with due process the highest ranking former official. That's really what it comes down to. The whole idea behind this country, need I remind you, is what? That we threw off the tyranny of a king. And what is a king? A king is a special kind of person who sits above the law and above his subjects and is immune from the law in key ways because he is the law. That's it, the distilled essence of the core principle of monarchy. The law and the man are the same. Nearly 250 years ago, we rejected that in favor of a nation of laws to which everyone is subject. There is no greater test of that principle than this moment we find ourselves in right now. And people are freaked out about it. I, again, I get that. But it's deeply weird to me to be an American, particularly a patriotic American, and be unwilling to face this test because it is a test that we must be able to pass.